I'm really happy to be here with you today, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer questions for us. Oh, well, thank you, Anna. I'm delighted. Thank you. So if it's okay, I'll launch right into the Certainly. first question, um, which is you mentioned this morning that in healthy controls who have had pharyngitis the two prior weeks that you do see elevated autoantibodies. So what separates that group of healthy controls who have autoantibodies from our kids who have autoantibodies and end up presenting with the neuropsychiatric symptoms? Well, as I talked about this morning, um, the uh, study that we've done shows that actually in pharyngitis usually the antibodies are present from infections because obviously uh, from a streptococcal infection you get these antibodies uh, but they disappear in a couple of weeks whereas in disease uh, such as Sydenham Korea or Pandas so these, these anti the antibodies continue to elevate in those with quote an autoimmune uh, type of disease and then disappear in uh, pharyngitis when it doesn't, it's not leading to any type of illness okay. in those children. And so is it the blood ring barrier that is compromised that leads to the neuropsychiatric symptoms in some but not others or what's happening? Well there? I think one of, one of the uh, hypotheses is that yes, the blood brain barrier opens and closes depending on trauma to the brain or, or um, infections that a child may have sure. or be exposed to because a child can be exposed to something and then suddenly have a flare and not really be totally sick right uh, except for their um, their pandas flare okay. uh, so the blood brain barrier can open and close but also um, uh, there could be other risk factors that are involved. If, you know, we're not we're not certain of they can even be other environmental exposures or genetic predispositions that we don't know yet. Sure, perfect. And then along the same line, what separates those who have autoantibodies from those who end up with full blown autoimmune encephalitis? What's the difference okay. between the two? Well, I think that this morning I've talked about how uh, cross-reactive antibodies or molecular mimicry that us as scientists call the mechanism for rheumatic fever that those antibodies lead uh, lead to disease but in, in children that just have the infection and don't go on to get the disease they are they are there only when for a short time sure. only when they get uh, pharyngitis or have impetigo when they get a streptococcal infection and I think for those that are or not immunologists, I'll try to simplify it, Perfect. Uh, is that people uh, that get infections over their lifetime from the time they're born, you're developing your immune response. And based on just the principles of evolution, we try to kill two birds with one stone, or there's, quote, survival of the fittest. And so we all are trying to prevent infections in our bodies, and so this is a normal response. And people that have autoimmune disease have very elevated autoantibodies, but there can be people that have um, a lot of normals have autoantibodies. They're at sure. lower levels usually than in the autoimmune disease, but these represent those antibodies that are actually against infectious agents that we are, we are uh, trying to prevent okay. or defend ourselves against infectious agents. Thank you. Um, can you comment on the various reasons that CAM kinase 2 might be elevated, the different causes? Uh, the the uh, CAM kinase 2 is, uh, I think I'd like to explain in the beginning that the way we study CAM kinase 2 uh, is that we take uh, children's sera or we have a, a, monoclonal, a human monoclonal antibody, we place it on a neuronal cell and the cell responds to antibodies that bind to receptors or to antigens on the surface of the neuronal cell and the way it responds to these receptors is by activation of the CAM kinase 2. Uh, so the, uh, the response to that, uh, there is a normal response and it's, pretty, it's really very low, around uh, 100 sure. units. Um, but in the case of disease, it can, it can be as high as 250, like in Sydenham, Korea, okay. or in pandas, uh, and a mean might be 155, but it can also be as high as that seen in Sydenham, Korea. But I also pointed out that in certain, in certain diseases, uh, these uh, antibodies actually um, uh, 
or actually what I was going to say was that the um, there had been mutations or variants in the cam kinase gene sure. and so these actually may lead to autism okay. uh, but that's different that's different from the autoantibodies because the autoantibodies are affecting the outer part of the cell and uh, binding to the membrane and to receptors and causing the cam kinase to undergo activation inside the cell. Whereas in a situation where you might see a mutation or a variant of the cam kinase gene, uh, these are primarily in animal models that people have done this. Okay. And they actually see um, behaviors that would be characteristic of autism. Okay. And earlier today you said um, that autism is not hands. And we hear a lot yes, of times right. yes. uh, clinicians even, and definitely parents, equating well, them to the same thing. Can you elaborate yes. more on Well, pandas, uh, pandas is pandas, and ASD right. is ASD. Sure. And so um, our hypothesis is that uh, in ASD, that pandas exist just as a comorbid condition, sure. and it is not, pandas is not ASD, and should not be mistaken for it. And so in ASD, you may have tics and OCD-like behaviors and other behaviors that would be associated with pandas. But, um, but this would not be ASD. It would just be simply, a, and it can be confusing uh, to clinicians sometimes as to whether a child has ASD or PANDAS. And so therefore, um, ASD, I suppose, could be, or PANDAS and ASD could be misdiagnosed, and like some children sure. with ASD might have PANDAS. Sure. Do you have a sense for whether children with autism are more vulnerable to ending up with PANDAS or PANDAS? No, we really don't know, and we don't know yet the percentage of children with ASD that have PANDAS. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, what do you think it would take for the medical community to accept the Cunningham panel, um, you know, have, to have widespread acceptance of the Cunningham panel as a tool for diagnosis? Well, of course, you know, we, we would love for everyone to be accepting of it, but uh, I think that there are uh, controversies that need to be addressed, and one, of course, is the controls, which we right. talked about, that, you know, these diseases actually come from infections. Right. And so it's not surprising that, that controls or anyone would have these antibodies, but they don't remain high uh, for very long, and people that are normal have continued to elevate sure. in people that are sick. So. Um, the acceptance of it, of course, I think, is that people read about this, and we're trying to work on getting more papers published to describe these studies that have been done with pharyngitis, with streptococcal pharyngitis, showing that the antibodies are there, but they go away very quickly where they continue to elevate in Sydenham, Korea, or, or pandas. Okay. Um, the um, studies that we've done for 20 years uh, if, I think that maybe people listen to others rather than reading the sure. literature and that it really is, a, is important that people actually try to read what we've published over the last 20 years and they might be uh, more encouraged that the test might be useful for them uh, if, they, if they were to read the literature. Right. We even have a transgenic animal that we, we put uh, an antibody in and the gene is expressed in the animal and uh, it comes from the B cells of the animal sure. and is expressed in the serum and we break the blood brain barrier and the antibody gets in the brain and actually attacks the neurons. You can see it inside the neurons okay. of brains in animals that we transferred that gene sure. for the antibodies from Sydenham Korea actually okay. uh, into the animal. So it's uh, it, part of it is that I think it's uh, also a disconnect between those that do clinical work and those right. that do research, and it would be really, uh, really important for, um, really important for, um, for us to uh, try to educate people sure. about the research that is uh, has been done over the past 20 years. Right.
So we're hearing more often that PANDAS is autoimmune encephalitis, but some children have more mild symptoms that we don't really think of as being associated with autoimmune encephalitis. They're still attending school, they might not have the cognitive decline. So can autoimmune encephalitis be a spectrum or do you have comments on that? I think so. I think okay. that, you know, encephalitis, any itis means an inflammation. Sure. And so I think that, um, uh, and I mean, it, everyone has their idea of what they think of as encephalitis and right. most think it's this severe thing where you're in a coma right. and can't speak uh, or that you're so crazy and out of your head but sure. uh, inflammation can cause many symptoms in our brain right. and so I think that even the uh, milder uh, cases are a type of post-infectious sure. um, autoimmune encephalitis because the autoimmune, there are the autoantibodies and then the inflammation comes from the immune cells that are, of course are producing the antibodies and also uh, the T cells that get into the brain and sure. uh, help break the blood brain barrier. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Cunningham. Oh, well, we really you. appreciate it. This is really helpful. I enjoy helpful. talking to you. Thank, thank you. you. I enjoy getting more grateful for your work. Thank you.